On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the James Webb Space Telescope finally complete. The Dream Chaser space plane shows off its new wings. Rocket Lab holds out for better weather. Falcon 9 breaking booster turnaround records and new developments in Chinese rocket launches. There's a lot to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. The James Webb Space Telescope has completed its full setup of all five onboard instruments, and now we can all witness the images from a fully cooled and operational space observatory. Sitting at the L2 point, one and a half million kilometers from Earth, and on the side opposite the Sun, the James Webb Telescope has been spending the better part of this year, since its launch in December 2021, getting all 18 of its delicate hexagonal mirrors into alignment, and cooling the apparatus to allow for testing. And we've already seen some amazing images out of this telescope without it even running at full potential. The previous work to focus the telescope was done only with the main camera, known as the NERCAM. Now that the James Webb Space Telescope has all five instruments in focus, we're seeing some really sharp pictures. Let's give a quick rundown of the players involved. First up, NERCAM. The near-infrared camera is Webb's primary camera and can take two images next to each other to provide a wide panoramic view of about 2.2 arc minutes. That's about 1 15th the width of the moon. NERCAM is set to look at a bandwidth of 0.6 to 5 microns, deep into the red spectrum of light and way past what our eyes can see. This is what lets the web find objects we normally couldn't. Next, the MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument. Its whole job is to scan for the longer wavelengths from 5 to 28 microns, making colder objects more visible. Very helpful for finding colder brown dwarf stars and the space dust that forms stars and planets. The FGS, or Fine Guidance Sensor, isn't really a camera, it's used to lock on to guide stars and help the telescope stay pointed where it needs to with amazing finesse. It can be used to take images too, but that's not its purpose. And finally we have the NEARIS, the Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph. This guy sits in the same assembly as the FGS and also serves as more than just a camera. Like other spectrographs, the NEARIS is designed to measure a large array of characteristics of the target objects, and it's how we'll know things like the temperature of stars and planets, the chemical composition of comets and atmospheres, and so on. This, in addition to the NERSPEC, the Near Infrared Spectrograph, is designed to give us all that juicy data on the outstandingly sharp images the James Webb is capable of getting us. But the engineers still aren't quite done calibrating yet. Each of these systems, now that they've been focused, needs to be fully tested to make sure their components are all working according to expectations. Once that's done though, we should finally be getting back the hordes of data the James Webb promises. Best guesses are that we should see the first full array data around July. And speaking of coming into focus, Sierra Space seems to be making progress with their space plane Dream Chaser. The small and sleek next generation shuttle is designed to fly cheap resupply missions to the International Space Station and is intended to be launched on top of the Vulcan rocket system and glide back to a landing strip with its small wings and lifting body. From the new images released, we can see many of the subsurface components and the whole shell really taking shape, giving us our first real look at a fully realized Dream Chaser. The first Dream Chaser, named Tenacity, has recently passed structural testing and is just being fitted with its thermal protection system and other components before being sent to NASA's Neil Armstrong Test Facility in Ohio for further tests. This is likely to happen in August or September, and the thermal vacuum testing will take four months to complete. The first functional Dream Chaser will be used for NASA's commercial resupply services to contract awarded to Sierra in 2016 and will launch about a year from now, uncrewed. Sierra says they are working on a crewed version of the space plane that could be ready for launch by 2026. This will be important for Sierra's ambitions for Dream Chaser as a crewed version is intended to be used for commercial flights, especially to the Orbital Reef Commercial Space Station 
a Blue Origin project the Sierra Space is a key contributor for. There's also some talk of Sierra wanting to make a national security variant of the Dream Chaser platform, but as usual, any details on that subject are being kept close to the proverbial vest. SpaceX has begun shipping large quantities of their new Raptor V2 engine to testing facilities at Starbase, Texas. On April 26th, Elon Musk tweeted out a photo showing three rows of engines under the production tent, writing, Raptor 2 rocket engines at Starbase, each producing over half a million pounds of force. The latest count seems to show that 19 Raptor 2s have arrived at Starbase since March 30th. These are currently being built and tested at a nearby factory in McGregor, Texas that was constructed specifically to mass produce Raptors in 2021. This is an upgraded and streamlined version of the same engine that was used in the initial testing run for Starship. Elon has always said that the engine represents a major evolution from past Raptors. Most importantly, Raptor V2 was designed to cut both production cost and time. To achieve that, almost every major component was either fully redesigned, tweaked, or refined in some way to make the Raptor more simple and compact. Elon Musk says that the result is a new engine that costs half as much to build as the previous version, while also being significantly more reliable. It's also significantly more powerful now. The older Raptor 1 engines that were installed on Super Heavy Booster 4 and Ship 20 were designed to produce around 185 tons of thrust, while Raptor 2 takes that up to 230 tons. They achieve this by running the engine at a record-breaking main combustion chamber pressure around 4,400 PSI. After the recent testing damage to Booster 7, it's not looking pretty likely that the new batch of Raptor engines will be installed into the thrust section of Super Heavy Booster 8, which should be finished construction very soon. Following that, we'll finally get to see some more static fire testing with the Super Heavy with up to 33 Raptors installed. Well, it seems that all that work on infrastructure has started paying off for SpaceX as the commercial rocket company broke its old reusability record by six days and two hours. On Friday, April the 29th, Falcon 9 booster B-1062 lifted off the Launch Complex 40 pad at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station to deliver a batch of 53 Starlink satellites, just 21 days and six hours after an identical launch. The previous record was held by Falcon 9 booster B-1060 when, back in 2021, the rocket delivered a Turkish comm satellite and some Starlinks only 27 days and 4 hours apart. SpaceX reported that the refurbishing of B-1062 actually took just 9 days, which indicates that actual turnaround can be much shorter once procedures and inspection processes get streamlined. SpaceX holds the top 19 records for orbital rocket turnarounds, the next closest competitor, Blue Origin's Shepard Booster, which isn't even orbital, takes about 59 days to get ready for a new launch, which still doesn't beat NASA's old record for the Space Shuttle, which took about 54 days back in its prime, and is the 20th record holder for fastest orbital turnaround. This fast turnaround for the Falcon 9 is really great news for SpaceX and its plans to send a steady stream of satellites, gear, and cargo into space. And with the completion of all their new infrastructure at the Cape and South Texas, we can be sure they're going to tighten up that 21-day turnaround even more. April 29th saw a lot of rocket activity apparently, as China launched a couple of remote sensing satellites into orbit. The Chinese Academy of Space Technology, an arm of the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, developed the two satellites to gather optical imagery for a whole host of industries like mapping for environmental protection, natural resource surveying, as well as agricultural transport, rural development, and that sort of thing. The satellites were delivered to orbit on a Long March 2C rocket from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center in the Gobi Desert and it's the 12th launch in a program of over 50 that the Chinese Academy of Space Technology plans to push for commercial groups like Landscape, X-Base, and Galactic Energy. A second launch originally planned for the same day using a Long March 11 solid rocket had to be scrubbed due to bad weather. 
That launch was due to take place in the East China Sea, something that we're going to be hearing more about very soon, as China has been developing launch infrastructure in Haiyang in Shandong Province, Ningbo in Yaojiang, and Wenchang International Aerospace City. Wenchang in particular seems to be a large point of focus for the Chinese space community with a bevy of commercial and state launches planned for the site when it becomes ready for large-scale use by 2024. Chinese President Xi Jinping also recently visited the site, voicing his support for the location to become a world-class spaceport. The city sits on the island province of Hainan and has hosted a total of 16 launches since opening in 2014, and its next big launch will be in early May, putting a Long March 7 rocket into orbit with Tianzhou 4 spacecraft to continue the construction of China's Tiangong space station in a six-launch program. The facility is looking to expand to include dedicated launch towers for the Long March 8 rocket, in addition to dedicated facilities for other commercial rocket companies like iSpace and Deep Blue Aerospace, both of which have signed up to have a presence in the city. The expansion of facilities in China's seas will hopefully allow the country's space push to really boom, allowing for larger and more frequent launches in the near future. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.